Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa wala rabbi shahli sadri wa yasalli amri wa hlu luqtatan min lisani yafqahu qawli rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina daban nar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu everybody. Welcome to our zakat workshop today. Uh, zakat workshop is something that we like to do every year around the time of Ramadan or just before Ramadan. Uh, and it is generally at this time that uh, I conduct this because uh, a, a lot of people choose to give their zakat in Ramadan because it is a beautiful thing to do in Ramadan. You get uh, more blessing and more reward. You uh, are essentially doing two, um, you're essentially taking care of two obligations in the same month. And then that is a source of extra blessing and, and goodness. So that is why we choose to do this workshop at this time. And alhamdulillah, I'm really glad that you have joined us here today. Uh, that is our zakat. Um, or zakat. What we're going to do is we have, of course, today a few things to cover. We have uh, to cover uh, the, uh, the concept of zakat, how to calculate zakat, uh, and... Um, we also have to, I'm going to show you how to calculate zakat. Uh, the way we will do things is that we will take a break for uh, the prayer, uh, for Maghrib prayer at uh, around 8 o'clock, whenever the time for Maghrib comes in. And uh, and then after that, we'll resume. My hope is that by Maghrib time, we would have finished the vast majority of our um of our uh, content and then after Maghrib we can do uh, question and answers inshallah ta'ala. Uh, what do we have as our agenda? Let me share my screen with you inshallah so you can follow along with me. Um, the agenda that we have is as follows. Uh, firstly, we'll talk about why should we give zakat? This is a very important uh, question because if you understand why we're giving zakat, then it will be easy for you to give zakat. Uh, number two, we will discuss we will discuss uh, what exactly is zakat, and specifically, uh, what is zakatable wealth and what is uh, not zakatable wealth. This is a word that, uh, you know, as you can see, Microsoft Word is telling me it's not a correct word. <laughs> and it's a word that uh, is coined to discuss the idea of when it is that, or uh, what type of wealth do we give zakat on and whatever wealth is exempted from giving zakat, all right? And we're going to talk about who gives zakat and who receives a zakat. Very important because not everybody uh, is eligible to be a recipient of zakat. I can already see a question in the QA about a husband and a wife. That's a very good question. And we will discuss more of that today, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, but we, uh, that is an important discussion itself. Then when do you give zakat, right? Do you have to give it in Ramadan? Do you give it, uh, you know, at like say 1st of January? What is the date? We will discuss that. Do you give zakat all at once? Do you give zakat over time? Like, do you wanna, can you do like a payment plan of zakat if you're supporting somebody? And also we will discuss where to give zakat. Do you, should you give zakat abroad, back home? Should you give zakat, you know, maybe, um, just locally, maybe a combination, what about family, lots and lots of things to discuss. And I hope that you will be with me for the entirety of this presentation, inshallah ta'ala. I will also share with you or show you my uh, zakat uh, calculator. This zakat calculator is a small uh, tool that I have uh, put together, alhamdulillah. And this is going to be able to, this will help you calculate your zakat and uh, I think it will simplify your calculations, inshallah ta'ala. Without, without further ado, let us get cracking. Uh, why give zakat? I always like to begin with why we're giving zakat because that really solidifies, uh, the, the, that sets the stage for us, that really does set the stage for us about zakat. Uh, first and foremost, zakat is a pillar of Islam. The Prophet Ali Sallallahu said, "Buni al-Islam ala khabs." The the Islam is built upon five things, and we call them the five pillars or five arkan of Islam. Uh, number one is shahadati Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. This the testimony of faith that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is his final 
messenger. Number two, iqam is salah, establishing the prayer, uh, a very important part of our uh, identity as a Muslim. It's not just to pray, go through the motions, but to establish it, to make it something meaningful. Wasawmi uh, Ramadan, fasting in Ramadan. Uh, ita, sorry, um, Iqamat al-Salah, wa ita is zakat. Number three is to uh, give zakat. Wa number four, sawmi Ramadan, uh, fasting in Ramadan. And number five, wa hajj al-bayti man istata'a ilayhi sabila. Uh, f- uh, the pilgrimage to uh, the house, which is uh, the, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Mecca, uh, uh, al-Ka'aba, to the sanctuary, al-Haram, uh, for hajj whoever is able to do so. These are the five pillars. And the Prophet said that Islam is built upon these five thiller, pillars, meaning if you were to remove one of these five things, the concept or the, the, the identity of a Muslim collapses. Just like if you were to remove a pillar from a structure, the, the, the building would start to collapse. Same idea about uh, zakat and the pillars it is one thing that it's it is the thing that holds up our identity as muslims okay uh, that is important because this is not something that we're doing as philanthropy to help people uh, just for the sake of helping people optionally we actually do this as an expression of our faith we do this act giving zakat as an expression of our faith this is what this is what means to be muslim giving zakat fasting, praying, going to Hajj. That's what it means. And that's one of the reasons uh, that we, that is the primary reason, in fact, that we give a zakat. Okay. Also, zakat and charity in general is, number reason number two, is a proof of a person's commitment and devotion to their faith. The uh, Quran says, وَمَا تَفْعَلُوا مِنْ خَيْرٍ uh, Whatever good that you do, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بِهِ عَلِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that good that you're doing. Okay, that's a general idea. But then more specifically about zakat and charity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, whatever money uh, that you give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, يُوَفَّ إِلَيْكُمْ is going to be returned back to you. You are going to see that money come back to you. Uh, and you will not be wronged in the least. Okay, So this is a beautiful idea for us that uh, charity is a proof of our faith. We are putting our money where our mouth is. Our uh, mouth is saying, yes, Allah, we believe in Allah. When we give charity, that shows we believe in Allah because we are now implying or we're expressing that that money that we've given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as sadaqah, that is going to be returned to us as he has promised. So it is considered to be a proof of our commitment, of our faith. Like the Prophet said, was sadaqatu burhan, giving charity is a evidence of a person's commitment to their faith. Okay, that is uh, two reasons. And I'll tell you uh, reason number Three. Reason number three is zakat is an institution. Zakat is an institution in the religion of Islam. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that zakat is something that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, established uh, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, uh, it's not a personal matter only, right? It's actually meant to eradicate poverty from society at large. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, This is a very beautiful, a very powerful ayah of the Quran. Uh, I'm going to show this to you. Uh, where is my translation? Ah, there it is. Um, that uh, yes, this is the ayah. These are those who, if we establish them in the land, they would say their prayers regularly and pay the zakat, enjoying the good and forbid the evil. This is an important consideration, right? That zakat is not just an individual act. Zakat here is establish them in the land, meaning now people here are uh, governing land. And as part of governance, 
they establish the institution of the prayer and everything that comes with the prayer, the mosque, the, uh, the social aspects of praying and coming together as a congregation, the education centers that are coming together as part of this, all of that is aqamu uh, salah okay? Wa'ata was zakat, paying zakat is the eradication of poverty from society. It's good that's done to, to people's, uh, the establishment of prayer is good for their souls, is good for their social well-being, and the eradication of poverty is good for the society at large, for their uh, monetary well-being, to uplift people. And this is an institution that the Qur'an highlights, and the Qur'an uh, encourage, uh, encourages those who are in governance. The idea is, brothers and sisters, that zakat was meant to be the thing that takes away economic inequality. It takes away poverty. That's what it was meant to be. When the scholars would be asked back in the day about how much zakat should you give to a recipient who was asking for zakat. For example, Imam Ahmed would say, Yu'ta, uh, you know, kifayat asana. He would say that he should be given uh, as much as he needs for the year. Hmm? When a recipient comes, give him to the point where he is going to be happy for the rest of the year and doesn't have to worry about how to meet his needs. Subhanallah. Imam Ashafi'i would say he would be given or should be given kifayat umurihi to the point that it sustains him for the rest of his life. Meaning, he's not saying that you're enabling people to become bums or something. No, that's not what Imam Ashafi'i is saying and that's not what zakat is for either. What he's saying is give him so much that he doesn't need to come ask again, i.e. lift him out of poverty. Give him enough zakat that he is no longer poor. And, and this is such an incredible concept. Sometimes we forget that the bigger picture of zakat isn't just 2.5%. It isn't just putting some money in a donation box. It was actually to remove poverty and economic inequality from society. Of course, not to make everybody exactly the same. There's always going to be people who have more and, and people who have less. But the lowest people, the ones who need the most help, um, you know, monetarily lowest, the zakat was supposed to lift them up and lift them up and bring them to a point where they are, uh, they have, they're dignified members of the community. Keep that in mind as, you know, whenever you think about zakat and when you give zakat. All right. Now, let us proceed to what we have in our agenda. We have why we give zakat, right? Very good. We talked about that. What is zakat? Let's jump to that. What is zakat? What is the definition of zakat? Here is the definition of zakat that you find in the books. It says, Lughatan an namau wa ziyada. Okay. Linguistically, it is uh, something that is growing, something that is blossoming. That is uh, what zakat linguistically means. All right. Now, he says, Summi wa summi al mukhraj al mukhraju zakatan li annahu yazidu fil mukhraji minhu wa yaqihi al afat. Very interesting. He says that uh, the, the one who is giving. Uh, or, or the, the amount that's taken, um, the amount that's taken from uh, a person, the one who is donating, uh, al mukhraj, what is he is taken from this person, it, this should be a kasra actually, uh, it increases the one who is giving zakat and saves them from or saves her from the trials and tribulations of life. Subhanallah, this is the idea. Zakat is actually something that increases us in goodness and protects us. That is at its core uh, meaning, linguistically in its etymology. You see the word kha and sad, right? The, from the root letter repeating in this definition again and again okay very interesting obligatory spending from a specific type of wealth given to a specific 
group of people at a specified time. This is the definition that we find in, for example, books like Arraud uh, al-Murbi'ah, for example, uh, the, um, the, um, the, the explanation, the Hanbali text that explains zakat and other branches of Islamic knowledge. Okay, so this is the technical definition. If you were to break it down, you will start to see some things that are quite interesting. Number one, it is an obligation. It's not something that's an option that we discussed that. It is from a specific type of wealth. And as we will discuss, there is zakatable wealth and not zakatable wealth. We're going to talk about this and that's the specific type of wealth that this is referring to. I'm gonna split this into like two and keep the agenda always up front here, all right? Specific type of wealth, all right? Then given to a specific group of people who gives and who receives, very specific, it's not, uh, it's not haphazard. It's not everybody who can get, who has to give, and not everybody is eligible to receive. And at a specified time, when do you give zakat? All right, that's the definition, really, of this. As found in the books, is what's setting the table for us in this workshop. Okay, now uh, I'm glad, mashallah, that some of you are already adding your questions to the QA, and I will encourage you to add your questions to the QA. Uh, here that will be awesome that will aggregate them in a nice way and I will go through them in order inshallah ta'ala please uh, take advantage of this feature jazakallahu khairan to you all okay now zakat let us explore uh, some words some terminologies that we should be familiar with zakat we've defined already obligation a pillar of islam sadaqa is an any type of charity it is philanthropy it is uh, you know, helping people. It's optional. The difference between sadaqa and zakat is sadaqa is optional. Zakat is mandatory. Sadaqa is generic. You can give it to anyone at any time, as much or as little as you want. Zakat is very specific. You give a specific amount at a specific time to a very specific group of people. That's the difference between sadaqa and zakat. Nisab, another important word, the minimum, minimum amount, excuse me, the minimum amount of money you must have before you are required, before you are required to pay zakat. That is the nisab. Now, the nisab is actually calculated per asset class. As we will talk about what is zakatable wealth, we will come to the idea that there are different asset classes, four different asset classes in the Sharia, okay? For each, the zakat has its own minimum, all right? Uh, since we uh, value everything in dollars, okay, in a fiat currency, uh, the best course of action for us is to take its closest parallel, which is gold and silver. So we take the nisab for gold or silver and choose that to be the nisab, uh, the minimum amount of money you must have before you're required to pay zakat. Now, traditionally, if you go back maybe, I don't know, even 15 years, uh, and most definitely if you go back many more years, gold and silver were close. Gold was almost always more valuable than silver, uh, but they weren't at the disparity that they're at today, right? Today, silver is very, like, it's uh, vastly undervalued compared to, to gold, okay? So if you were to consider the nisab for silver, the nisab for silver is approximately, so it's 595 grams of silver, that is approximately $600, okay? That is not ex actually a great indicator of whether a person has wealth or not, whether they have savings or not, okay? That is because of the disparity in the price. The 85 grams of gold comes out to approximately $6,000. Uh, $6, uh, and that is uh, a, closer, a closer value or a closer estimate of a person's, uh, you know, wealth and whether they are, uh, you know, wealthy enough to give zakat or poor enough to receive zakat. So this is a good, uh, a better, a better uh, marker for that. So we will set or we will pick from the two the nisab for the gold as our nisab. That means you must have this minimum amount before you're required to pay zakat. If you dipped below the six thousand dollars, 
okay, in savings. And this savings is all your assets, not just your bank account. This is all your assets that are zakatable, as we will come to it, okay? All of your zakatable wealth, if it was above 6,000 throughout the year, you pay zakat. If it dipped below $6,000 in the year, you do not pay zakat. This is the concept of the nisab. Okay, people, are you with me? Say something. <laughs> people <laughs> say something people please inshallah it will be nice uh to hear from you all participants can chat with everybody yes all right thank you brother khalid appreciate that brother manaf as well dr manaf thank you very much okay so let's have a question let's take a question the question is if i have saved seven thousand dollars for the year do i pay zakat yes or no do I pay zakat? Yes or no, people? And the answer would be yes. I pay zakat on this wealth. Why? Because it is greater than the nisab. Are you with me? Okay. If I have $1,500 saved for the year, let's make this more interesting. Okay. If I had, you know, say 7000 for most of the year, hmm, but I dipped to 1500 at a point in the year, okay? Here's the situation. I have $17,000 if I had $17,000, $7,000, excuse me, for most of the year, but I dipped to 1500 at a point in the year. Do I pay zakat? What do you think people, yes or no? The answer, as uh, mashallah, most of you are saying, no, correct. That is the correct answer. No, because, because you dipped below the nisab, right? You dipped below the nisab, and that essentially means that you are not going to be paying zakat. All right, people, that's the concept of a nisab. I hope that you understand that. Now let's get to zakatable wealth. Zakatable wealth. Okay, what is zakatable wealth? Here is some conditions or some things that need to be in place for us to say zakat is due on wealth. Okay, we'll talk about the assets and the classes of assets shortly. But before we even get there, these are some very important questions. Okay, for example, number one, istiqraruhu. Like they say in the books of fiqh, istiqraruhu, accessible, i.e. unhindered access to wealth. If you have unhindered access to your wealth, zakat is due on it. If you have hindered or your wealth is inaccessible, if your wealth is inaccessible, excuse me, there is no zakat on inaccessible wealth. That's why we exclude, for example, pensions, because pensions are, by definition, inaccessible wealth. We will talk a little bit more about investments later on, right? But I am going to just give the idea of pensions here for now. We'll come to like uh, locked in accounts maybe later as well. But the idea is pensions because they are restricted and you cannot access them uh, unless you are retired and you're collecting your pension, correct? But for the people who are working, they are unable to access that. And thus, istiqrarul mal is not there, all right? Unhindered access to the wealth is not there. Excluded for that reason. All right, retained for one lunar year. Retained for one lunar year. This is important. Zakat is due every lunar year. It is not an income tax. You may, be able, you may be making a lot of money. You may be making $100,000, maybe $200,000, okay? But you might be in a situation where you're spending a lot of it. Hmm? Zakat is not your income tax. It is something that's due on your savings. You must have retained it for a year. That is a key difference between zakatul mal and, and taxes. Okay, because people ask this question, hey, how I pay taxes? Isn't that zakat? No, because you pay taxes on your income. Based on your income, 
and on your income. Whereas zakat is on your savings. It is not on your income. It is what you have retained. And that is interesting because you could have a person who is not making money, but they have saved a lot of money. Zakat will be due on them still. All right. Uh, greater than the nisab throughout the year, as we had discussed, if it dips below the nisab, no zakat. All right. Uh, Zakat is given on savings once a lunar year if you have unhindered access to the wealth and possession for a year. That's a summary sentence of what we have just spoken about. All right, people. Uh, let us... Uh, let us... Uh, I see some questions about uh, retired people. We're going to come to retired people, inshallah, ta'ala, in a sec. Okay? Um, let us proceed to Zakat is due on. Okay? This is what we'll call zakatable wealth. What is zakatable wealth? This is a word that we made up. This is zakat is due on this wealth. That's what zakatable wealth means. So what is zakatable wealth? Okay. Four main categories. A wealth is zakatable. Four. Exactly four. There is no fifth category. All right. Anything... <clears throat> Anything that is not in the four categories will be mapped back to these four categories. This is an important thing. Please keep in mind. Zakatul mal is called zakat and mal, right? The zakat on wealth. As mal changes, as the nature of money evolves and changes, now you have, um, we've had investment instruments for many, many uh, decades that didn't exist actually before. Hmm? Uh, like stocks, for example. And then we have investment instruments today that didn't exist even 15 years ago, like cryptocurrencies. And investment instruments today that exist that didn't even exist three years ago or two years ago, like NFTs, okay? And you will have many more things that will come up later that didn't exist today or that don't exist today. The idea is mal keeps evolving. Mal keeps evolving. So we take the evolution of money and map it back to one of these four categories that we're going to discuss and that's how we understand investments how do you uh, map it to these categories and then how do you pay zakat on these uh, categories all right so the first of the main categories is cattle or livestock and cattle livestock is camels cows sheep and and goats and you know not graders of all time goat but actual goats okay uh it is determined by each each type of animal. For example, you have um, uh, if you have someone has twenty five camels, the zakat of twenty five camels is one camel. They had twenty five camels for the year. At the end of the year, they give one of those twenty five camels as zakat. Okay, uh, this is the concept of uh, zakatul mal for cattle and livestock. I don't think any of you own cattle or livestock to be concerned about this. But I wanted to mention this for the sake of completeness, okay? Um, crop yield, a farmer, all right? The zakat for that is different. A zakat for someone whose uh, crops are irrigated naturally is 10%. فِي مَا سَقَتِ السَّمَاءُ الْعُشْرُ Okay? And the crop yield, if the crop yield is, uh, if the, cro uh, the crops are, uh, you know, if they are uh, artificially irrigated, then the crop yield is 5%, all right? And this is something that is the Quran mentions, give its right the day you are harvesting it. Interesting uh, that this zakat is due upon harvest, all right? Crop yield. I also don't think many of you are farmers. Uh, maybe back home, some of your parents might have been farmers, <laughs> but here, I don't think most of you are. Uh, so I will skip this category. Uh, but we come to now the main two categories, okay? The main two categories of zakatable wealth that everything that we own gets mapped back to. Cash, gold, and silver, what's called al-athman, right? Al-athman in the books of fiqh, or also it's called an naqdain babu zakat and naqdain like they say the two uh currencies gold and silver okay uh the zakat of that is 
uh, 2.5%. The Prophet said, okay? It is a 1 over 40. That's the fraction. 1 over 40 is 2.5%. All right? So that is our, uh, our idea of cash, gold, and silver. We'll come to this. We'll discuss this in quite a bit of detail today. Business commodities. This is products sold to make money. In Arabic, they call them urud al-tijara. Urud al-tijara, and there is zakat on urud al-tijara. Uh, they say that the urud al-tijara, the business, the commodities you sell to make money, they have zakat. Uh, there is no, uh, there is no zakat on the. Uh, on the tools used in business to make the products. But there is zakat on the, the, the source materials, the mawad, and on the products that are made and then sold, okay? In modern day terms, we call them current assets and fixed assets, okay? Current assets or short-term assets, they're considered to be liquid in a business and they are subject to zakat at the full 2.5%. Whereas fixed assets or long-term assets are illiquid and they are exempt from zakat, okay? This is an important uh, distinction between the two things. Uh, in urudu tijara, business commodities, the ones that you are, the materials that you're using, the product that you make, there's zakat on that uh, if you have held it or if you've retained it for a year, okay? Whereas uh, fixed assets don't have zakat. A good example of this is a bakery, okay? If you own a bakery, you wouldn't have to pay zakat on the equipment in the store, uh, nor on the land that the store is on, okay? Nor on the building, okay? But you would pay zakat on the profits from the bakery, the bread that is sold from the oven. Again, this is not taxes. Keep this in mind. This is not taxes. You don't pay zakat 2.5% of every bread you sell. It's what you have sold and you've accumulated in your business and you have retained for a year in either the, the, the gains from your business or the materials from your business or the commodities of your business, whatever of those things it is. It is zakat that you have retained for a year. That's what you pay zakat on. Uh, or assets that you retain for a year. That's what you pay zakat on. So this, uh, brothers, brothers and sisters, is business commodities. And this is important because this is, in my opinion, what we will map stocks to. Okay, Particularly if you are long on a stock. If you are like a day trader or a swing trader, or maybe you just you know go miskin, just do something here and do something there. You're nothing in terms of your methodology. Well, uh, let, let's not talk about maybe someone like that. Maybe uh, it is uh, someone who uh, would consider their investment a stock like cash. But if you are long on a stock and you're holding that stock and you're like, this is a stock company I believe in and I will put my money here and I will let it grow with this company. Uh, then in, a, in, a, in reality, your stock is a business commodity. Hmm? It's a business commodity. Uh, and then we will be able to calculate and we will be able to fairly assess what is the current assets uh, of that company. And that's the part of the stock that you pay zakat on. Very interesting. Huh? So you could, in my opinion, this is the best way to think about stocks. Uh, okay. And we'll come to that in a little bit as we get there. Okay. Zakatable wealth. Not zakatable wealth. What isn't zakatable? All right. Property. Property, there is no zakat on property. Hmm? Imam Malik says, uh, uh, very interesting. He says there is no property other, there's no zakat on anything other than these four categories. Hmm? There is no zakat on residential property. There's no zakat on the value of the investment property. Hmm? Nothing. Okay. And Imam Malik or Imam, sorry, Imam Ahmed says even like, you know, uh, even if the person is purchasing property just to run away from zakat, still the idea remains that 
it is exempted from zakat. It is not zakatable. I wrote here zakat is due on rent, but again, rent is here again. It's not like you collect rent and 2.5% automatically goes to zakat. The idea is if you have collected the rent and you've held the rent for a year, that's when zakat is due, just like on any money that you have. Okay, borrowed money. Borrowed money is not your money, right? So that kind of money does not have zakat uh, due on it. You subtract that from your total uh, total assets. Haram wealth, because the Prophet says, in Allah tayyibun la yaqbalu illa tayyiba. Allah is pure and he does not accept anything that is uh, impure, okay? So haram wealth is impure and thus there is no uh, zakat on it. And, uh, and that's why it's not to be paid. It's not supposed to be used or consumed at all. That's the idea. The idea isn't, all right, let me earn haram wealth so I don't have to pay zakat. The idea is get rid of this haram wealth. Earn from a halal source. Enjoy the blessings of the halal risk that Allah has given you that you have earned and pay zakat on that and enjoy the growth and the blessings that come from that, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, let me finish this. Uh, there's someone who has raised their hands. Let me finish this part and then I'll come to them, inshallah ta'ala. Um, inaccessible wealth, we spoke about that. Wealth that you cannot access. An example of that is pensions. Inaccessible wealth, there is no zakat on it. When you access inaccessible wealth, that is when zakat will start to become due but there is detail there, and we will discuss that detail a little bit later, inshallah, if you stay with me, okay? But until it is inaccessible, this is important, inaccessible wealth as long as it remains inaccessible, all right? Very, very important uh, qualifier there, all right? Now, what's not zakatable is regularly use jewelry. This is the Hanbali and Shafi'i, and I believe also the Maliki position as well, that they don't include in, uh, in, in, uh, in terms of uh, gold and silver. All right, this is uh, gold and silver only. Okay, let's add this here, okay? And this is the Hanbali position, the Shafi'i position, and the Maliki position. All right, let me actually just uh, read something to you here about precious metals. In fact, let's add uh, this, this section on precious, let me share the section on precious metals right now over here, okay? Uh, precious metals, the Hanafi position is you pay zakat on all jewelry. All jewelry, it doesn't matter what you're doing, wearing it, not wearing it it's an heirloom, it doesn't matter. You pay zakat on it, okay? That is the position of which school? Tell me. Which school's position is that? Type it, type it. <laughs> it's the position of the... This is important, you guys. You gotta know this, okay? The Hanafi school. Very good, okay? This is the majority position on the Muslim Ummah, by the way. Okay, if you go to an Azhari mosque, they probably tell you that. If you go to someone in Pakistan or India, uh, the, a, a Deobandi Masjid or any place that follows the Hanafi school, they probably tell you that. This is the dominant madhab of the Ummah for centuries. Okay, so that's why this is the dominant position. Okay, uh, but of course, historically, there have been other positions. The Shafi'i, Hanbali, and Maliki position is no zakat on worn jewelry, okay? This is something that they mention uh, because the um, uh, the the Prophet said, okay? Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, the Prophet said that uh, gold and, and silk has been permitted, permitted for the women of my, uh, of my of my nation, right? But it's uh, impermissible for the men. And based on that, uh, they, they say that, you know, this is uh, okay, it's exempted because the jewelry here, uh, uh, you know, is like the clothes of the women. And that is why it's exempted. And also there's a hadith of the Prophet that says, لَيْسَ فِي الْحُلِيِّ زَكَاتٌ 
there is no zakat on jewelry that's worn. Now, uh, the Hanafis ex uh, don't accept this hadith as to be authentic. They say this hadith is not strong, and that is why we will not go by it, all right? Whereas the other schools say, no, this hadith is strong, and we will accept it, and that's why there's a difference of opinion uh, between the scholars and whatnot, okay? Uh, there is a uh, anything, everybody agrees, that gold and silver that you bought for investment purposes is fully zakatable. Gold and silver that you bought for investment purposes, fully you pay zakat on uh, without any questions, without any differences. Only differences about jewelry that's worn. There's also the matter of heirlooms. Heirlooms is quite off common in like, in, you know, in almost every culture, to be honest with you. Uh, an heirloom, in my opinion, is something you should give zakat on because an heirloom is, uh, in essence, an investment. It's holding value, okay? Uh, if you give an heirloom to your child on the day of their wedding, if you didn't have the heirloom, you would have to go purchase that on the market, yes? And then you would give it to your child. So it's, in essence, an investment. You bought it early, many years ago, and today you can give it at a you know at a high value so if you i believe it's more of an investment than a regularly used jewelry and for that purpose it should be included and that is a irrespective so to make things easy gold and silver that is for that is investment yeah zakat across the board everybody accepts that gold and silver jewelry that is an heirloom an heirloom is you put it in like a storage box and you put it in your bank and it sits there until your kids get married, okay? <laughs> that heirloom, zakat on it without really any difference of opinion. Zakat are, is, uh, excuse me, jewelry that's worn regularly by women and you can define regularly as something that's in their closet, okay? It's not like they're always wearing it. It's something that they would have in their closet. The gold and silver of that, according to the Shafi'i, Hanbali, and Maliki position, you don't give zakat on that. The Hanafi position is you give zakat on that. I wanted to explain this part because this is a subject of confusion for quite a lot of people. Uh, and I wanted to clarify that the, let's break it down by uh, its items, right? Its items. And, uh, and maybe if you were to rewrite this in a little bit uh, clearer way, I will rewrite it as such. I will rewrite it as investment. Let's put gold and silver, right? Gold and silver investment uh, zakatable, okay? Heirlooms zakatable. Jewelry, okay? Zakatable for uh, the Maliki Shafi'i and the Hanbalis, not zakatable. Sorry, not zakatable, excuse me, for the Maliki Shafis and the Hanbali, zakatable for the Hanafis. Okay, this is the easier, I guess, classification of gold and silver. All right. All other valuables, diamonds, rubies, platinum. I don't know what else people would collect as metals that are precious. Baseball cards, <laughs> um, your collection of Air Jordans, your cars, your laptops, your equipment that you really like at home for making videos, your phones, all of them are not zakatable. All of them are not zakatable. Okay, so this is our uh, basic understanding of what's zakatable and what's not. I'm going to pause here to take some questions, inshallah. What's zakatable is four categories. Cattle and livestock, crop yield, cash, gold, and silver, and business commodities. And in the business commodities, your short-term assets. The stuff like the, the, the bread, not the oven. All right? Anything else Properties, not zakatable. Uh, loans exempted from zakat, not zakatable. Your uh, money that's inaccessible, 
as long as it's inaccessible, not zakatable. Gold and silver, for investment purposes, zakatable. For heirlooms, zakatable. But for jewelry, according to the school of the majority, the Hanbalis, the Shafis, and Malikis, it is not zakatable. For the Hanafis, it is zakatable. All right? This is the idea behind zakatable wealth. I'm going to actually add one more thing here, which is the investments, okay? Because investments are, uh, I think it's worth our while to discuss this right now, okay? Uh, because this would kind of, uh, it ties into the concept of, 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 of what is uh, zakatable with, from your investments. This is an important concept. And then I'll take some questions before we head out. Um, let let me sh let me share my screen again. Okay, here is what we say about investments. Okay, investments we will say are analogous to gold, silver, cash, gold or silver. Okay, we will say they're analogous to that. They're like it, or we will say they're analogous to business commodities. Either of those things is going to be true. Okay, and then we ask ourselves the following questions about our investments: Is the investment fully accessible? partially accessible or inaccessible and number two did you voluntary voluntarily contribute to this investment these two questions are to be uh, applied to investment accounts let's apply them okay two questions accessible and voluntary okay it is not accessible and you did not contribute voluntarily okay that means there is no zakat there's no zakat. And the best example of that is pensions, CPP particularly. You did not voluntarily contribute to it and you can't access it, okay? Assuming you're not retired right now, okay? That means that is something you do not pay zakat on at all, okay? By consensus. The opposite of that is, uh, let me keep this, this part here. Let me keep this... Uh, these two questions out on the screen so you don't forget. The two questions we're asking ourselves is this, accessibility of the, of, the, of the wealth and voluntarily did you contribute to it or not? Okay, the other side of the coin is you, it's fully accessible and fully voluntarily you contributed to it. What's the example of that? Can someone think of an example of an investment account where fully accessible and you are contributing to it 100% voluntarily. You're doing it by choice, not out of compulsion. Can someone think of an example of an investment account? Let's see. Ah, Ahsan, Sister Huda, well done. Excellent. The TFSA, right? The tax-free saving account. Perfect. That account, hmm, the entire amount is zakatable because you can fully access the money and you have voluntarily contributed to it. All right, now let's come to the middle, right? We've got the two, ex to two end cases. Now come to the middle case. That's where things get interesting. What if you voluntarily contributed, but you can access partially your wealth? In that case, the portion that you can access after subtracting taxes and penalties is zakatable. An example of this is the self-directed RRSPs, all right? A self-directed RRSP is where you are voluntarily contributing for tax benefits, okay? You wanna save taxes. That's why you're putting it in your self-directed RRSPs. And if you were to go and withdraw that money, you would be suffering a withholding tax. If you withdraw 15,000 or more, it's 30%. If you withdraw, I think, under 15,000, but more than five, it's 20%. And then 5,000 or less, it's 10%, right? This is from the CRA. I didn't make this up. So that is something that applies to you. That's a penalty that applies to you, okay? You take away the penalty, and then what's left is the money you can access, right? And that's the money that you pay zakat on. This is voluntarily you contributed to it and you can access that investment partially. All right, now comes the more interesting case hmm? where you are voluntarily contributing, but, but what? What's the last case here? 
voluntarily contributing, but what? It is, ah, excellent. Thank you, Brother Khalid, Dr. Manaf, Jazakallah khairan. You can't access that money. You're doing it, you're putting it in, but you can't touch that money. And that is where there's details. There's details. R-E-S-P, excellent, Sister Huda, Ahsanti. Beautiful, that's exact, exactly the example. You are voluntarily putting money in the RESP. You're voluntarily putting money in the group RSP, but you cannot access that money. RESP, technically you can liquidate the account, of course, but that's not your intent and you won't do that, okay? Uh, and group RSPs, you can't access it until you have uh, left that company and they have transferred the account over to you, all right? Now there is some details. What do we say about that? Well, let's go to a analogous situation. I'm gonna go to that situation here and share that with you, right? Do you, do you all see where, I'm, where we're going, right? What we're trying to get to is, how do you understand investment accounts that are modern day phenomena? This is the mal of today, yes? How do you pay zakat on the mal of today, okay? And there is uh, some detail in that matter. Let's get to uh, investment accounts uh, that are RESP. Let's talk about uh, this con concept. Inaccessible, but voluntary, all right? This, in my opinion, my humble opinion, is analogous to what's called malu damar. Malu damar is a concept that you they would say, this fuqaha would say is a person uh, he he has uh, it is his money. The, the, the mal is mulkuhu, right? Or milkuhu, excuse me. Walam yakun al intifa'u bihi. Walam yakun qadiran ala intifa'i bihi. But he is unable to benefit from that money. It's his money, but he can't benefit from it. All right? Not just from an access point of view, but he can't like actually like benefit from it. Okay, what is that example? They give the example of money that someone buried under the uh, buried in the desert. They are burying their treasure in the desert. You can guess that's going to go wrong somewhere. <laughs> and then they forgot where they buried their treasure. All right, what are the, what do you do? It's your money. Hmm? You voluntarily put it there, but right now you can't access it to benefit from it. This is Mal Damar. In my opinion, this is the best analogous situation that we have to these kind of accounts, group RRSPs and RESPs, okay? In my opinion, that's the best analogy here. And in this case, there are three examples or three opinions to be considered. The Hanafi opinion is no zakat, no zakat, because the money isn't accessible. Sure, you buried it, but you can't find it. Too bad. No zakat. Once you get it, now you start to pay zakat on it after you've had it for a year, right? Uh, this is something, by the way, similar to a pension of a person. Once they have, maybe the pension has been collecting, collecting, collecting as well. Now, when they retired, they still like, uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, this is uh, something similar to uh, the group RSP, because pension you still cannot fully access, right? You can only take a little bit out of it, whatever they give you, whatever is permissible, right? Group RSPs uh, and RESPs. There is a point in time where you can fully access that wealth. What is that point in time? Group RSP when you leave the company. RESP if your children go to school or your children did not go to school and now you take the money back from that account. Now, when you get that money at that day, According to the Hanafis, the clock on that money starts on that day. No zakat before it, now the clock starts, all right? The Maliki say, well, uh, slightly, we're gonna differ with you slightly. How so? Well, you, the day you get your money, the day you get your group RSP, you pay zakat on the value once, and that's it. Not every year, even if it's been for many, many years, you were unable to access that money. But the moment you get it, once you pay zakat on it, and that's it. The day you get it, not a year after. 
The Shafi'i and Hanbali position is more, more intense. They say every year you haven't had it calculated zakat. So group RSP calculate at the end of your first year at, of employment, zakat of year one, then zakat of year two, zakat of year three, zakat of year four. And say year five, you have left the company and now you get your group RSP. Now you tally all your years zakat and you pay it now the moment you receive it. That's the Hanbali and the Shafi'i opinion. Now, if I'm getting into too much detail, I wanna give you a full overview. Now, let me simplify it after giving you the full picture. Here is, in my opinion, the best and the safest opinion. Now, the safest or the best opinion here is the Maliki opinion because it does not penalize you for the years your money was inaccessible, correct? It does not penalize you for those years. It's not like you're every year you're calculating zakat. At the same time, it does not let, it does not lose sight of the purpose of zakat. The purpose of zakat is money should keep moving, right? You take it, you invest it, it grows, great. But if it's sitting idly as savings, you take a portion of it and give it to the poor. You see, that's the purpose, like it's at its core, as zakat is supposed to keep the money moving through the economy, all right? Uh, so it doesn't let lose sight of that either. Meaning what? Meaning that you held the money, it wasn't moving for so many years. So once you get it, at least once you pay zakat on it. All right. So this, in my opinion, this, in my opinion, is the best way. Let's go back to that slide again. Right. Is this, in my opinion, is the best way to look at RESPs and group RRSPs that you pay zakat on them once once you get it, all right? Uh, this, uh, brothers and sisters, is zakatable wealth. Uh, wallahu a'lam. Let's take some questions before we pause for Maghrib and then we'll come back to the rest of this topic. We should be, like we're done the most important part now. And then I'll show you the calculator and then we'll be good to go inshallah ta'ala. We have a few people who raised their hands. Uh, uh, so maybe we can, uh, I'll, I'll ask, I'll let them speak inshallah and let's see what they have to say. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa Mamdou Hamza, Dr. Mamdou Hamza, Jazakumullah khairan Mawlana, ala hazi al-muhadra al It's very interesting topics. Uh, uh, I have a question here because uh, we have a uh, different uh, opinion from scholars regarding uh, investment, uh, especially if you are a builder or you invest your money with a builder. Mm. You know that the money doesn't come like each year. Mm. Uh, it is based on the projects. Yes. Some projects take two years, some projects six months, and so on. So some scholar says, when you get your money, uh, uh, you pay the cap. Mm. Uh, some say you pay on the principal, the original amount, and mm. the uh, return, mm -hmm. both 2.5%. Uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And some scholars say you pay 10% on the top of your return, not the, the principal because they consider the principle as if it is like your tools. Yes, they think of it like a crop. Hmm? Yeah, uh, so hmm. in this, especially in this situation, what's your opinion? You would like to uh, uh, shed a light on this uh, uh, point of view. Exactly, okay. thank you. Now you're talking about a person who is a, a investor in property, right? Yes, yes. That's what, that's what they're doing. Now, they will not consider their property as cash, gold, or silver. I don't think that's a fair analogy. But you can consider the property as what? As one of the urud al tijara as a business commodity. Yes. Okay? So I would say for someone whose business is, say, flipping houses, right? Their yes. business is to flip houses, okay? They should consider their house that they have purchased to flip a business commodity. And they should be calculating their current assets and fixed assets, right? What is the mawad 
and what is the alat, right? What are the materials and what are the tools? What is fixed and what is uh, current, okay? And that would require maybe a little bit of help from like an accountant or something, okay? Uh, because I, I, I can't tell you that. I don't, I don't know enough about that uh, industry, okay? But they should be able to calculate that. And on the current assets, they pay 2.5% zakat. Not on, like, I, I don't, like, the uh, the explanation of pay it on its gain or pay on the principal or this, it, it doesn't have, like, a asl, right? It doesn't have a, 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 a textual foundation, so to say, right? Or maybe it has a weak textual foundation. The stronger textual foundation is you break it down by current assets and fixed assets, right? And the fixed assets are exempt from zakat. But current assets are not exempt from zakat. Does that does that make sense, uh, Dr. Mangu? Yes, just uh, uh, for clarification. Uh, suppose that you are a builder and you hire uh, the people, so you don't have any assets. <laughs> there is no current asset and the fixed asset. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. well, so it's your money and you invest it. You purchase the land, right? To purchase the land, you purchase the building materials. Yes, and they hire people to build and they sell it. Sure, but so the land you purchase is your current asset. Yes. Your, the building materials you're purchasing, mawad, are your current assets. The yes. people you employ, the alat, are your fixed assets. Yeah. Okay? So you calculate it based on that. Wallahu alam. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, Brother uh, Ibrahim uh, Rifai, or sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. No, it's like, Assalamu alaikum, brother. Uh, it's a nice talk. Exactly. Um, I have three questions. First one, if you have a car and you use it for Uber, um, is it becoming a fixed asset then? Just uh, again with the dis um, discussion that you had with the other brother. Yes, it's a, it's a it's a, a car is a fixed asset. It's not considered. It's a it's a tool. It's a tool. Okay. So no. So you don't have. Okay. Second question is. Um, if you have a um, three percent mandatory contribution in your RRP or Group RESP, uh, Group RRSP, and then but you max it out to eight percent, in that case, um, do you need to um, pay zaka according to the one that you said? As soon as you that amount become accessible to you you pay Zaka once and then that's the way? That's it. So group RSP, the moment yeah. you leave the company and you get the money, mm -hmm. subtract the withholding tax and pay Zaka on that the day you get it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, my third one is again for RESP. Um, <laughs> it's a self-directed RESP. Yes. Uh, is it, will it be the same way as same soon way. as I get? So, okay. So your child goes to university, the first day they get the RSP, you know, like you would draw money from RSP for them, the day mm -hmm. they get it, before they pay their tuition, 2.5% they give in zakat. Right? Okay. And the rest they okay. pay. Yeah. Okay, here's the other thing. I have been calculating based on the mm -hmm. last couple of years, uh, year end, whatever value, and I have been paying zakat that way. Mm -hmm. uh, before, because I went to another talk and they said, it doesn't matter, although it's not as accessible, like the, the thought of uh, Imam Shafi and other madhab, I was paying that way. Now, yeah. is it okay to, to switch back to this way then? Absolutely. So again, this is, uh, this is a great question, my brother Ibrahim, this is an excellent question. Understand please that this is a fluid topic, right? These investment vehicles and these instruments uh, did not exist before, right? Uh, the nature of mal is different now, correct? Mal evolves. With it, zakatul mal will evolve. Uh, if your mal is simple, you just have money, gold, silver, easy stuff, very easy, there's no complication. If your mal is complex because you have complex uh, investments, then your investment calculation or your zakat calculation will be more complicated as well. You see? So that's a, just a given reality. We shouldn't say, oh, how come things are like this? How, how come things no. are hard? But because but, you have complicated wealth. That's why you, have, you need okay. a complicated answer, right? Yeah. Uh, or a more, more nuanced answer, correct? Yeah. 
Uh, I have two more questions, maybe if I, that's, that'll be same. I have I'm some- saying that to you, Brother Brian, I'm just saying that generally, okay? I wasn't intending you. <laughs> no, no. I have two more questions. So one is- Brother, Brother Brian, if you don't mind, sorry to, to interrupt you. Yes, yeah, pray. If you want to take a few more questions or a few more people, if and then we'll have you come back and ask your questions again, if that's okay, because okay, I don't sure. want yeah. others to that's feel fine. like- All right, thank yeah. you. Uh, we'll take one last one here from Brother Hussein, and then inshallah, we will break for Maghrib, I will come back and show you the zakat calculator, inshallah, then. Uh, Brother uh, Hussein, go ahead, please. Assalamu alaikum. Barakallah uh, uh, Now, I understand that RRSP, you don't have to pay every year, right? If you could contribute with your employer. So this year, you don't have to, to pay yeah. when you get them, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, and it is like, so what if I just like kept them till retirement, till 65, then I stopped getting them? Yes. That's the day. The day you get it, right? So to see the value of, of, of the of the of the investment uh, at that volume. point. Yes. Reduce okay. subtract all the taxes that would be deducted if you were to access it and then pay zakat on the remainder. You see? Okay. And if if I if I want to take them just before retirement. Like now, if I want to take them, if you so if you leave your company, right, uh, and I want to withdraw them, right. So on the amount you can get after withdrawing, that's the one you give zakat on. So let us say it is twenty five thousand. Yes. I'll take thirty percent off yes. because the government will take thirty percent yes. off, right? Yes. Let's make it hundred thousand. <laughs> okay, seventeen thousand. Yeah. yeah. So you take out thirty percent for the withholding tax. You left with how much? 70,000. That is what you pay zakat on the day you get your group RSP from your company that you have left. Okay. Well, one more thing, if it's, if it's possible. Mm. Now, if my wife, she has a jewelry, mm. they are wearable, but she has, she has no access to this uh, jewelry. It's, they are back home. They are not with us here. here mm. and uh, uh, But they are wearable, but they're not with us. Still, are they uh, considered as asset or uh, wearable jewelry? So the like jewelry is not accessible right now because you are not able to go home, right? Uh, yes. It's, it's far away. It's, it's, it's fine because it's inaccessible temporarily, right? However, it, the moment you're like, don't let that be like a reason to like exempt things. You know what I mean? Like, or no, like no, a perpetual. No, no. Yeah, not with right? us because we, she yeah. did not brought the jewelry with her here. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, the point is this, right? That yeah, the, no, no. With jewelry, no. Uh, so it's, uh, the, the, if if it's if it's jewelry that she would have worn if she had it, right? Yes. Then yes. you can exclude it as if she has it. Okay, but if it's jewelry that she had, she had it right now. She wouldn't have worn it. She would have put it in a box and put it away for the kids. And that's the one you should pay zakat on. Okay, thank you very much. Barakallah. Exactly. Uh, Dr. Manaf, if you don't mind, we'll take your question after Maghrib. Yes, inshallah. Because Maghrib has just come for us here in London. So we will uh, stop. Please uh, keep your uh, hand up so I can uh, you know, allow you to unmute yourself if that's okay. Uh, please do come back because we have uh, you know the the exciting <laughs> the exciting zakat calculator to go through. Uh, you if even if if you hate excel you will love this spreadsheet if you love spreadsheets you will love this even more <laughs> inshallah so we're going to take a break and then we'll be right back jazakumullah khairan please uh, you know just um, stay on the call inshallah ta'ala and then we will resume right after a salah maybe a 10 minute break or so jazakumullah khairan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam muhammad ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain assalamu alaykum uh, Brother Ibrahim was also asking some questions, but uh, do we do we finish all your questions, Brother Ibrahim, or not? I, I don't. I have a few more questions. Okay, let's see if Dr. Manaf is there for, with us first, and then if he isn't, then uh, you can go ahead and ask. Thank you. It seems like he's not here yet, so please go ahead. Okay, uh, my next question is. Um, you probably mentioned, but I might have missed that. So if I have a stock from my company, but then uh, the rule is I have to retain some of the stock that I, uh, one year retention. So that means the year I bought, uh, one year 
the stock I bought last previous year, I cannot sell this one, that particular amount, but I can sell anything before that. So the way I used to calculate is because that's not accessible for last year. So I will subtract that amount and pay Zaka for rest of the money. Is that a right calculation? Uh, that's good. Yeah, that makes sense, inshallah. Okay. Uh, the last one. I have some self-directed R RSP. Mm. Uh, you probably say that, but um, again, uh, do I need to pay Zaka given that 30% will be deducted if I pull that money today? or I should hold it until I take the money out. No, we, we made, the, this is something that we made clear, right, in the presentation yeah. that self-directed RSPs are different than group RSPs. Self-directed okay. RSPs, you have partial accessibility. You don't have full accessibility, but also you don't have, they're not inaccessible. So that okay. makes them uh, partially accessible and whatever you can access from it after the withholding tax is deducted, that's the one that you pay Zakat on inshallah. Okay, and it will be every year then, every even though I'm okay, inshallah. Okay, okay, let us go now to our uh, our spreadsheet. Okay, uh, we've been uh, that there is, if you go back to our original presentation, we had this agenda the agenda of uh, why gives a cat, what is the cat, what is the catable wealth, what isn't, and then who gives the cat and who receives the cat. I would like to actually. Before we get to this who gives a cat uh, part, I actually want to speak a little bit about, uh, you know, the calculation of it. Like, how do you calculate the cat? Uh, because if someone has to head out, I want them to actually see this part uh, quickly, uh, you know, beforehand. Okay. So this is the Zakat calculator. Okay. And I have split it in two spreadsheets. Okay. And this is goes also back to, to when a little bit. Okay. Uh, this I've called it scheduled payments. You see this word here, scheduled payments. And this one I'm calling zakat lump sum. Okay. Why this differentiation? The reason for this differentiation is that uh, most of our money comes in schedule, salary, on you know, child tax, TCB payments, whatever payments you're receiving, right? It comes in in a schedule. So. Uh, if you were to be very precise about it, it would be that every time you get money, you would track that specific money. Hmm? <laughs> that would be quite hard to calculate zakat on, right? So that is why we say for your scheduled money, money that's coming in to your account and then going out and coming in and going out, Take the balance of your uh, of your accounts, all of them, on your zakat due date. So, say my zakat due date is first of Ramadan. Okay. Now, on the first of Ramadan, I will look through all of my gold, all of my silver, all of my cash, all of my TFSAs, all of my RSPs, any other liquid investments like crypto or anything else any money that people owe me, I have given them a loan, okay? And I will calculate, do this calculation on that day and I will pay zakat on it. Even if maybe part of the money that I have in my bank came the day before Ramadan because that was the payday, right? But since we are making it scheduled payments, we're trying to simplify the calculation for ourselves. Let's do the calculation here. We take the gold, right, in ounces from jewelry. Assume you're following the Hanafi opinion here, right, and you're paying jewelry, gold on jewelry, uh, zakat on jewelry, the gold for, part of it, and you say, I have an ounce of this. And maybe you have two ounces for investment. This is for all, all opinions. The investment, everybody says you have to do it. Uh, silver from jewelry, okay, maybe you have, uh, okay, well, let's make it three ounces. And then for investment, maybe you have 10 ounces, right? It will tally up, right, the spot price and I'll arrive at this calculation for it. For jewelry, right, for fair value of jewelry, it uh, gives you a resale price, okay, which is about 80% of the spot price because if you take your jewelry and you won't sell it, it's about 80% of the spot price that is quoted, right? So to be fair, the 
formula accounts for that, all right? Uh, it does not, uh, it takes that uh, into account. For example, if I was to remove uh, all investment uh, amount here, you would notice that it is taking uh, the resale price. But if I was to remove the uh, the the amounts here from uh, gold and silver and just add only investment, you see it takes the full spot price amount for investment. Because investment, you can probably get the spot price or very close to the spot price, okay? So let's assume this is like just the same way we had it. Uh, you know, this is our uh, gold and silver uh, assets. Alhamdulillah. Okay, now I have cash at bank. Maybe I look at my bank account. I have $4,000. Not all of those $4,000 came today. Okay, this is actually should be a number. Sorry. Stay number. There we go. Okay. Uh, not all 4,000 of those came today, but we are doing this to simplify our calculations, schedule payments. We will tally them all the day our zakat is due. Okay. All right. Cash in hand, same thing. Maybe you keep a whole bunch of cash under your pillow. Maybe you keep a whole bunch of cash under your mattress. But even if you don't, maybe you have like a couple hundred dollars just lying around in your wallet or something. You add that cash in hand, okay? Uh, you know, funnily, I, I used to, I, I made this spreadsheet for myself about 10 years ago. And I remember, and I, I, I used it for many years and then I was like, maybe this is something others can use too. And then Alhamdulillah, I started to share with people and they were happy to use it. What's interesting is that before cash in hand was a big deal, <laughs> you would have, people would carry a lot of cash with them, right? Even just 10, 15 years ago, I remember, right? It was a bigger deal. Today, it's almost like no one has any cash on hand. Allah mustad. okay? So that's that. Now, you put the value of your TFSA accounts, the entire value, because the entire TFSA amount is to be added. See, if I was to add it here, 5,000, maybe, okay, maybe let's say this person is, uh, you know, has done well for themselves. Okay, they have $25,000 in their TFSA, okay? Now, check this out. RRSPs, it will actually calculate the withholding tax for you. There's a formula. If you put 5,000, it will calculate that your withholding tax is 500, and add 4,500 to the total assets, okay? If you were, see if I was to make it all zero, just for the sake of showing you, right? If I was just for the sake of showing you, make this all zero, you will notice that you add 5,000 for the RSV account, it will tell you your total assets of 4,500 because it will subtract the withholding tax from it. Now, this is true for self-directed, okay? This is true for self-directed, and the group RSP when? The day you get it, yes? The day you get it, the day you have left the company and they've transferred over the funds to you, Bismillahi mashallah, now you add it on and that is when you add that amount to this and it will subtract the withholding tax for you. But say you have done well also for yourself and the value of your RSP self-directed account is say $100,000, okay? But not all, not all 100,000 are added. 30,000 have been deducted from the withholding tax and only 70K has been added here, right? And again, if I was to show this to you again, just by removing all these numbers, just so that's very clear, if I was to add 100,000 here, as you will see, only 70,000 of this is present over here again. All right, let us add our numbers again. Uh, was our cash at bank 4,000, cash at had 200, TFSA twenty five thousand, hundred thousand for their R for their R uh, RSP liquid investment. The man bought crypto. He bought <laughs> bought Bitcoin <laughs> and got rich with the Bitcoin. Masha Allah. So they have sixty thousand dollars worth of crypto. Allahu Akbar. Good for you. <laughs> they have Masha a lot of assets now. Okay. Well, alhamdulillah, this is good. But now you have a lot of liabilities. This person maybe has you know you take the principal part of your monthly loan payment. Maybe this person is paying, uh, you know, five hundred dollars uh, of principal for student loans. Okay, maybe a thousand dollars a month they're paying as the payment, and five hundred of it is the principal. First thing you should try to get rid of all of your interest-bearing loans as soon as possible. But assume you have some. Okay, that's that. Maybe they are also five hundred dollars uh, for their car. Allahu Akbar. Maybe there are $2,500 or $2,000 for their uh, mortgage. It will calculate that your monthly uh, principal part that you are in debt of is 3,000, 
Yes. And that means that your long term loan, that is like that money isn't really your money. That money is owed to somebody for the year is thirty six thousand dollars only on the principal part, not the interest. Of course, we're not condoning interest here and saying, yeah, go ahead and take these loans. What I'm saying is if you have them, this is how you calculate. But ideally, you don't have interest bearing uh, loans upon your head. You should try to get rid of them as soon as possible, right? That is right there. Maybe a personal loan, a person owes maybe $4,000 to their friend, okay? That is you add, uh, and then you look at your liabilities and it's 40,000. You look at your assets, it's 165. Subtract the two, you get your net assets, right? You get your net assets and they are 125,000 and 2.5% of that is 3,139 and that's the zakat that is due on this person, okay? This is how the calculation works. You take your total assets, remove from it your liabilities, which is your loans. Okay, this is not, you're not doing a tax deduction here. Please don't try to like add everything to like reduce your zakat amount. Only add the loans that you owe, okay? Money that you owe, you're left with your net and assets and that is what you pay zakat on. Now, also on the flip side, I have this lump sum. The other sheet is a lump sum one, right? Maybe a person sold their, say let's put, uh, you know, maybe on the, um, I don't know, uh, first of Muharram, okay? First of Muharram 40, uh, Muharram 1442. You gotta track the Hijri date, by the way, okay? Uh, you sold your car and you got $30,000 on that day, okay? So then on the first of Muharram uh, 1443, you will pay $750 of zakat on that 30,000, that lump sum money that you had. Okay, this is something that's fair because it's not scheduled payments that are coming into your into your account. This was a lump sum that came into your account. And if you were to add this, for example, to your final tally, you would pay zakat on it before the year has passed. Now, if you do that, if you choose to do that, you're like, you know what, forget lump sums. I'm gonna add everything here. I am going to add the, the you know, forget lump sum. I'm gonna make this 4,000, I'll make it into, that, that 30,000 will add it here, no problem. You have paid zakat early, alhamdulillah, that is no problem, okay? Uh, and that is in a way, ihsan, hal jaza'u ihsani illa ihsan okay? But if you want to say, you know what, it's not fair, my lump sum, I never had it for a whole year, you can keep the lump sum away and track it separately. That is an option that you have as well, wallahu a'lam. So this is how this uh, the calculation works alhamdulillah now let's look at who gives zakat let's look at who gives zakat and who receives uh, who gives zakat uh, any muslim uh, once the nisab is reached money is accessible the lunar year has passed they are giving zakat okay an orphan there's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars on the matter uh, but the but the uh, stronger position is that the the uh, guardian of the orphan should give zakat on the wealth of the orphan until the orphan become comes of age and deceased a person who passes away uh, if they pass away and they owed zakat for the year before right uh, then that is the zakat that they pay if uh, the or the deceased person owes zakat from even before then that zakat must be paid before the inheritance is distributed Wallahu a'lam. What if lump sum money will not be kept for one year? If you don't kept, keep the lump sum money for the year, you've spent it. What? No zakat, you spent it, right? Lump sum is for, uh, zakat is on savings. Money you have kept for a year, right, Brother Khalid? So that is an important consideration. If you don't keep the lump sum for a year, money is not, there's no zakat on it. Wallahu a'lam. Okay, who receives it? Hmm. Who receives it? There are eight categories of zakat recipients, uh, and I will show them to you here, inshallah. In the Musadaqatu Lil Fukarai, Wal Masakini, Wal Amilina Aleha, Wal Muallafati, Ulubuhum, Wafir Rikabi, Wal Gadi Mina, Wafisa Bilalai, Wabin Sabil, Fadi Watam Minallahi, Wallahu Ali Mun Hakim, a very beautiful ayah. The ayah of Quran that lists for us the eight categories of zakatul mal recipients, people. I need you to help me out here. 
okay? And, 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 and count with me, yes? Are you ready? I know you're, mashallah, watching intently, but I want you to participate even uh, more, inshallah. All right? So, first category of person is إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ First category is who? In the ayah? It's right there on the screen. The first category is Okay, I'll tell you. The first one is the poor. Yes? The poor. The second one. Thank you, Sister Huda. The second one is Wal Masakin. Al Fuqara Ahsan Sister Siam. Uh, Siham, excuse me. Uh, masakin is number two, the destitute. Is there a difference between a faqir and a miskin? What do you think? Is there a difference? Yes, if you think there's a difference. No, if you think there's no difference. Mm, we have a few people saying yes. There is a difference, Mr. Allah says. Very good. Excellent. Indeed, there is a difference. And that is because the Quran lists them separately. Okay. Who is poor, in your opinion? The faqir, the poor, or the miskin, the destitute? The translation won't be able to tell you. But in your opinion, who is poor? Number one or number two? Who do you think? Just take a guess. It's, um, you know. Mm. So there's quite a few of you are saying the number one, the poor. Uh, some of you are saying number two. Ah, very good. Okay. How do we make that distinction? Well, let's look at the Quran. The Quran calls in Surah Al-Kahf, right? Maybe uh, we can sh uh, put up Surah Al-Kahf here, right? Look at this ayah from Surah Al-Kahf. Uh, oh, my goodness. What happened here? Hold on. Oh no. The, did you see the interface changed? My goodness. I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> okay. Let us. I feel like I'm lost. <laughs> All right. Look at this. Amma safina tu fakanati masakina ya amaluna fil bahar. Mm. The boat belonged to some poor people who made their living from the sea. Huh? What's the word there? Masakin, right? Masakin in the Quran are described as someone who, these are masakin, they have a boat, they work, they have a job, they work, they make some money, but they're probably not making enough. Do you agree? Yes or no? Do you agree with that? They're probably not making enough money. Yes, perfect. That's what the Quran calls a miskin. Hmm? The, the person who is a miskin. Let's go back to uh, the, 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 the thing here. Okay. I call the person who's faqir uh, someone who's broke. And the one who's a miskin, I call them destitute. Okay. You can think of them as as follows. Someone, this is from the books of fiqh, by the way. This is not my uh, percentage. This is from like the Rawl al murbah Someone who has nothing. Okay? Or they have up to 50% of what they need to uh, sustain themselves. Okay? Uh, in the books, they say, Al-Fuqara ashaddu hadatan min al-masakin liyanna Allah abada'a bihim wa inna ma yubda'u bil-ahammi fal-aham. Faqir is uh, even more in need. This one, the first one, the guy who is broke, is even more need in more in need than the miskin. Okay. Faqir is described as somebody who has nothing up to 50% or less, or less than 50%. That is a faqir. So if they need $20. Uh, so let's, say, let's just say they, have, they need a uh, hundred dollars a day to survive. Okay, this person has zero to forty-nine dollars. That's what they have. They are a fakir. They can't even survive. Okay, and that's why they're number one in the list because they are the most in need of it, and we need to help them the most to get them out of this very difficult state. All right, and then you have miskin. 
الذين يجدون أكثرها أي أكثر الكفاية أو نصفها most of the kifaya or uh, or uh, or half of it so this is how they describe a miskin 50 to 100 uh, percent right uh, this is a person who in the books of fiqh they say for you a sinfan tamama kifaya tihima ma'a ayla tihima sanatan this is a humbly position both of these people in from zakat are given enough to make them 100% whole for the year for their whole family. I told you, zakat is eradication of poverty. It wasn't just a small handout. It wasn't a humiliation that here, take this little peanut and be happy. Zakat was meant to eradicate poverty. People were lifted out of poverty every year by zakat. That's how our fuqaha and our, uh, you know, ummah used to be, subhanallah, okay? Uh, and then they say something interesting. A miskin woman malaka wa law min athman in mala yaqumu bi kafayatihi fa laysa bi ghani, right? Someone who owns stuff, but that is not going to be enough to sustain them, it's not considered rich. So for example, someone who owns a home, but has very little money that they can, you know, live off of, okay? Because their income is low. That is still a miskin. That's still a miskin. You don't have to be homeless to be zakat eligible. It's a very perverted way of thinking. Well, I don't know where we get that from, right? But, you know, it's not that, it's not the case at all. Uh, it, they can have things. The Quran says they own a boat, they have a job, yet they're miskin, yes? So this is an important consideration, important thing for us to understand. The other categories are, I'm going to quickly go through them. The one and two are the most important ones. Then you have, عَلَيْهَا, those who collect zakat. This is someone who is employed by a Muslim government. Uh, you know, if you give zakat to a, a Islamic NGO, they give zakat to a mosque, they are in reality a wakil. Okay, they are just a guardian over the wealth. Um, a collecting of zakat is generally for someone who was employed by the Muslim government to collect zakat and disperse zakat. Wallahu alam. Well, mu'allafati qulubuhum. Well, mu'allafati qulubuhum. Conciliating people's hearts. Number four, people who are new to Islam, the Prophet would give them zakat and that would bring them closer to Islam. This is not a bribe, obviously. The Prophet is not bribing people, sallallahu alayhi wa Hasha. Uh, but he is softening people who maybe were bitter, right? Maybe they've had battles. Maybe they've had they were adversaries, and now they accepted Islam and they're just you know they're they're not happy. The Prophet gives them zakat, okay? And uh, this is a category the Quran lists, and now all those grievances are put to the side. I have seen this with my own eyes, a new Muslim who is struggling with their life, struggling as a Muslim, struggling because their family has kicked them out of their home. I, I, I had this uh, in, in interaction with a, a, a young Muslim man who was a convert. He was 16 years old, he used to go to a private school. His parents, parents found out he accepted Islam, they kicked him out of his house. He went from being going to a private school to being homeless. Hmm? You don't think this person is going to feel something in their heart? Uh, and then, alhamdulillah, we gave him zakat. And of course, he was you know, totally deserving of it from the first two categories. But even after he became stable, still giving him zakat. Because this is a man who suffered for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? He has suffered. He was humiliated by his family. And he suffered because of his Islam. This is a person who is given as a means, you think of it like a token of appreciation, as a means to help them, uh, you know, rise above the challenge of being a new Muslim. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It's not bribing people to enter Islam. They're already Muslims. That's what, that's a key uh, component there. But they are now given this to uh, make the transition easy and to make the burden of life a little easier for them, Allah Alam. Okay? Wafir riqab to free slaves or prisoners. Number five. Wal gharimin. Number six. Those in debt. Wafi sabilillah for God's cause. Number seven. Wabin sabil and for travelers in need. 
Number eight, fadidatan min Allah, that is a legal obligation bounded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, a lot of details about what is, who is Ghari mean, who is Safi Sabir Allah. There's a lot of details here, which I we don't have the time to cover. Uh, but sufficient to say, uh, it is a topic of discussion and uh, it, it is something that uh, is applicable. People should be lifted out of debt if they have debt through zakat. The Quran says it, fi'wal gharimin, okay? And there is a lot of details about what the gharimin are, but of course they all say, al gharim is someone who is, uh, you know, madin, just has debt. And even if this debt is something that is uh, not, um, uh, you know, someone who is ma'afakrin uh, or ma'alfakr, He's debt. He's in debt because of himself. Like he did, didn't manage his money that well, uh, and this debt is not a halal debt. Still, right? Uh, right? This person wants to repent. He wants to get out of uh, debt. He wants to be better. Uh, they have to have a little bit of poverty. This can't be like a rich person in debt who wants you to pay off his debt with zakat. They're poor, they're in debt. They feel bad about the debt that they have taken because it's interest bearing or it was not a good decision. For yu'ata wa fa'adainihi. They say in the books, he's given the entire amount, subhanAllah. So he can be out of debt. Can you imagine, right? Like you have this, uh, uh, this uh, policy war in America about student debt and canceling this and canceling that. But in our books of fiqh, they say, this is a person who got into debt because he himself made some mistakes. And maybe this debt could be even a uh, muharram debt, right? A debt that's haram, okay? But now this man wants to repent and he's poor, right? Like he's not like a rich person who's in debt. He's a poor person, you know, you give him the money to get him out of debt. So now he can be unshackled, subhanAllah. What an amazing concept. Zakat is so incredible. Wallahi, we don't appreciate how amazing this, uh, this, this pillar of Islam is. We just think of it as 2.5%. We get caught up in the calculations. But if you think about what it means, Allahu Akbar, it will blow your mind. Okay, so that's some of those things that are there. And I wanted to highlight a little bit about what these eight categories are. I, I want to talk a little bit about who zakat is not given to. This is critical. And please pay attention for that. And then after this, we're pretty much done. We're just going to talk a little bit. We'll take questions, inshallah, okay? Who is zakat not given to? Uh, they mentioned it is not given to a Hashemite from Bani Hashem. All right? Wala tudfa'u ila Hashemiyin. Wala muttalibiyin. It's not given to the family of Banu Hashem. It is not given to the family of Abdul Muttalib, okay? These are the descendants of the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ has said that uh, they are not to receive in the sadaqata la tanbaghi li ali muhammadin. Okay, this is not uh, appropriate for the family, the descendants of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, uh, that is uh, the two things that I mentioned here. Now, of course, there's a lot of details like how do you determine whether you're Hashimi or uh, Muttalibi? That's a different question. But I wanted to mention this, uh, you know, uh, you know, just uh, as some as a you know summarized point. The point that's more interesting that applies is wala faqirin tahta ghani. They say a faqir that is under a rich person, a poor person under a rich person. What do they mean by that? They mean a poor person living in the same house or living in the house of a rich person. A poor person living in the house of a rich person. Classic example. Poor son supported by a rich father. That poor son, even though he may be a miskin, even though he may be a faqir, but because he's living with his father, who is not a miskin or faqir, is not eligible for zakat. Because you can see, this could be a little bit of hanky-panky going on there, right? So that is something that is not allowed. La ila far'ihi wa la ila aslihi. All right, I want you to imagine this. You have your family chart. Okay, visualize your family chart. Okay, who is directly above you in your family tree? Directly above you. That's called your, your asl. 
Who is that? Directly above you. Tell, tell me, tell me, people. Directly above you, in your parents, Ahsantum, very good, your parents, father and mother, right? Great. You cannot give zakat to your father and mother. Who is above your father and mother in the family tree? Well done, Sister Hoda. It is your grandparents. You cannot give zakat to your grandparents. Okay? Great grandparents cannot give zakat to great grandparents, and so on and so forth. Okay, that's the asl, right? Because that's where you came from. <laughs> Farah is who is coming out of you, okay? That's the one who is directly below you in the family tree. Who is that? Direct, directly below you in the family tree. Who is that? Directly below you. Children. Very good. And then, who else? Children. Grandchildren. Ahsant. Well done. Children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. All of them cannot give zakat to them. Okay? This is the idea. They, the asl and the far, vertically in your family tree, you cannot give zakat. But you can give zakat horizontally. Give zakat to your brother, to your sister, to your uncle, to your cousin, to your uh, whoever, right? As long as they're not, you know, vertically in the family tree in this manner, okay? Uh, also, they can't be a direct dependent like a wife. In Islam, the wife is a direct dependent of the husband. It's not in a demeaning way. This is in a way of, this is the man's responsibility. Okay? So, uh, the wife is not allowed to be given zakat. Because the wife, just like the kids, just like the parents, are your, you know, responsibility. The parents, if they have nothing, become the responsibility of the children. Of course, if they have their own income and their own, own uh, their own lives, there's no problem. You're not liable to pay for them. But in the case where they have nothing, you don't just give them zakat, you take care of them. Similarly, and even more importantly, actually, is the wife because she's living with you and she is 100% uh, you know, dependent on your wealth, as in like whatever her needs are comes 100% from the wealth of the husband. All right? That's a key point. Please also don't make the mistake of thinking the husband's entire wealth is the wife, is her wealth. It's not true, even though some of the wives might want to think that way. <laughs> but the correct understanding is 100% of the wife's needs are to be taken from the husband's wealth. And that is why she can't be given zakat. All right? So you think of the family tree. You cannot give zakat vertically, but you can give zakat horizontally exempted from that is the wife now the question is what about the wife given to the husband because the husband is not dependent on the wife here huh and they're not vertically related in the family tree there is a difference of opinion among the scholars okay there's a difference of uh, opinion amongst the scholars uh and wallahu alam right wallahu alam uh it is, it is not, it's something you shouldn't do. Okay, like the, they say, for example, wala ila zawjin fala zakatiha ilayhi. In the Hanbali position, the majority of scholars say it's not okay. Uh, uh, so, this is to be avoided, in my opinion. Uh, Mr. Siham says, uh, if your son is owed a lot of debt, you can't give him He's in the Ghari mean. Yes, he's in the Ghari mean, but you can't give him zakat. You cannot give him your zakat money. You can give him as your son, but not zakat money because he is from your asl. Uh, excuse me, he is from your fara. He is from your, uh, you know, he is right under you in the family tree. Okay, so this is important. Please understand the idea, right? It is given horizontally to people who are not your direct dependents. Uh, it is not given vertically, and it is not given to your direct dependents like wife and kids. All right. It has to be a Muslim. Last point. The recipient of zakat has to be a Muslim because the Prophet said, 
zakat is tukhadu min aghniyaihim faturaddu ala fuqaraihim zakat is taken from the rich muslims and given to the poor of them hmm? meaning it's taken from the rich muslims and given to the poor muslims he has qualified it and because he's qualified it it becomes restricted and that is why it's only to be given to a muslim you want to give someone who's non muslim you give them sadaqa you give them charity and you should the Quran, whenever it mentions charity throughout the last juz, which is in a Makkan revelation, vast majority of the times, it does not specify any religion for any person because you're supposed to help everybody at all times. That's sadaqa, yes? But zakat is malin khas, li ta'ifatin maqsusa. It's specified wealth for a very specific group of people. One of the conditions for that is they have to be Muslim. Okay, so that is the people who receives zakat and who don't receive zakat. We spoke about when you calculated the beginning of the lunar year. You uh, you can remove the lump sums. You can pay it right away if you want. You can give all of the zakat in one shot, or you can pay it in installments. This is installments, not to like uh, you know like Islamic relief. You're giving them in installments because you know <laughs> you think of this as like a loan or something. This is specifically about if you have someone you're supporting directly, your zakat is supporting someone directly, and you fear if you give them the entire lump sum on day one, they will go and blow it all on day one, okay? So you pay them in installments, no problemo there, uh, but you know that's the caveat there. And you can even pay zakat before. Maybe you found a great cause, you pay zakat right away. Alhamd, no problem, you calculate it at the due date of your zakat. The most ideal place to give zakat is your relatives because that is zakat and that is sulatul rahim. That's you know the obligatory charity and that is taking care of family. Family is important, have to be taken care of even if family is difficult. You see, it is recommended locally. Imam Bukhari, for example, had a very strong opinion about this matter. However, it can be given abroad. There's no problem in that. And under normal circumstances, you should prefer local, but under difficult circumstances, if there's a famine or something, it is preferred to be given to the place where there is the most need. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. So that, brothers and sisters, was our uh, quick look at zakat, even though we went quite a bit in, uh, in in terms of time. I appreciate your attendance, alhamdulillah, and I really appreciate you all being here and participating. We spoke about what is zakat and zakatable wealth specifically. And what isn't zakatable? The idea is zakatable wealth is mahsoor. It is restricted. It's not everything is zakatable. Okay. And we spoke about investment accounts and how we understand them as included in the zakatable wealth. And that goes back to the question of accessibility and voluntarily contributing to that or not. Okay. We spoke about who gives zakat and who receives it also when to give zakat and where to give. And lastly, we use this calculator to calculate your zakat. Uh, the Excel sheet, I will give you a link. The Excel sheet is right here, actually. Let me show you. Zakat calculator, I made this. Uh, this is uh, my blog that has not been updated forever, <laughs> right? But right here, you see zakat calculator 2021. Uh, yes, right here is the link. I will post it here to all attendees. And you can access it there, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, and this is the place where you can calculate, uh, download this uh, spreadsheet and use it. I also did a workshop on investments specifically. This was very detailed about investments, how to calculate zakat and stocks. Uh, so if you want to uh, you know, watch that, you can watch that as well. Okay. Alhamdulillah, that is that. Let's do some questions that the people have. Uh, I'm going to start from the first question, inshallah ta'ala, and, uh, and then go from there. All right. So first question, can a brother pay zakat to a sister who is married and independently, independently living with her husband if she is a miskina or a faqira or miskina or one of the categories of zakat? Uh, then yes, because remember, zakat is played uh, horizontally. It's good, not vertically. Allahu a'lam. All right. How do you pay zakat if you have health service-based business like a dental office? Excellent. Well, you calculate what is your fixed assets? Your fixed assets are your building, your buildings, your equipment. I'm thinking aloud here, uh, Brother Khalid. Huh? Your equipment, uh, your tools, okay? 
But then you have, for example, uh, short-term assets, the money you make. Hmm? That's the biggest short-term asset you have, the money you make. Now, if you have a specific amount of money that's been with you for a for one year, one lunar year, and that is your business income, then you pay zakat on that. You can treat your business as if it's like a separate entity for zakat because most people who have businesses treat it as a separate entity anyway, right? So that is a uh, thing to consider. Wallahu alam. I hope Brother Khalid is there to listen to this question, uh, inshallah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, brother. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, does the income tax, GST, HST, that we pay the government in a year have to be taken into consideration when we pay our zakat? No, it doesn't. Why? Because zakat is on savings. It is not on income. All right. Can I pay my zakat to my sisters even though they're not poor? Well, it depends. Are they, how poor are they? Number one, are they in debt? Right. Do they fall in, the ca in any of the categories? If they fall in the categories that are mentioned, then yes, you can pay them zakat. If they don't, then you cannot pay them zakat. Uh, Sister Isabel asks, if one cannot fast due to chronic illness or old age, is the fidya given only to fasting Muslims? Fidya can be given to any person. It is not given only to Muslim. You can feed whoever you want. There is no problem in that. And inshallah, it is encouraged to feed someone who is, uh, you know, who you can bring closer to you uh, by, you know, feeding them. It is totally recommended to do that. If my money is in a bank account that I have to free so that I don't pay, or I have to freeze, I'm assuming, so I don't pay monthly account charge, does that count as accessible money? Yes, because bank accounts, if you freeze them, you can unfreeze them as well. That's not accessibility. Accessibility is a pension. You can't access your pension. You, you know, like you can't just say, CPP, I have this much money, give it all to me right now. Can't do that, okay? So that is an accessible money. But this would be accessible. Do retired people have to pay zakat on their entire pension or the amount they receive annually? Not on the entire pension because that's not accessible to them even after they're retired. They only get access to a limited amount, the amount that they receive as income. Uh, so that, you know, it's the same idea. It gets added to their bank and whatever remains of it in the year is what they pay zakat on. Wallahu a'lam. Uh, but not on the whole amount. Okay, yes, freeze is good. I got that. Can a person pay zakat in advance for the next couple of years? Can extra zakat money be paid for the current year to be adjusted the next year? Okay, uh, so, and no zakat is not paid in advance. You can pay zakat before it's due. You can say, you know what, I will pay zakat. Say my, my zakat date is first of Ramadan. But maybe last month I found like a really worthy cause or a really good person to support. So I gave them money and I'm like, you know what? I'll do my zakat calculation on first of Ramadan. All right. I do my zakat calculation and I'm like, you know what? I actually paid this guy more than the zakat that I should have, that I owed. Alhamdulillah, I'm all done. Uh, that extra amount is sadaqah. That extra amount is sadaqa, it is charity, it is blessing, it is goodness, walhamdulillah. Uh, but I can't say, oh, you know what? I pay him 200 extra dollars. I'm going to take that and carry that over to the next year. That's not how it works. You can pay in advance, but then the, once the year resets, like the Prophet says, that uh, the zakat is when you, um, when you have... Um, that the year has passed on the wealth, that is when zakat starts to be due. Uh, okay, so it's not carried over the haul, the year when it starts, resets everything. Okay, but you can pay more in zakat. That's good. There's good. This is ihsan. This is doing well. Alhamdulillah. Where would TFSA go? Zakatable, non zakatable? We answered that it would be fully zakatable because TFSA is fully accessible and fully voluntary. A recording of this webinar will be uploaded, inshallah, and you will get a copy of it. Please follow us on our, uh, you know, uh, be on our uh, on our broadcast uh, group and our WhatsApp groups, inshallah. That's where we can communicate with you. Uh, and inshallah, you will get all the recordings and all the materials there. It's the best way for us to keep in touch. Uh, we don't spam, okay? <laughs> so don't worry about that. Uh, can you ca kindly comment on the scenario in which a person's loan amount exceeds their savings? Allahu Akbar. If that is the case, if that is the case. And in fact, let's look at that case, shall we? Shall we look at that case? I think that's a good, interesting scenario. Uh, let us look at that scenario. 
and let us use our Excel sheet to highlight that scenario. The scenario is as follows, okay? Let's take away this person's assets, okay? And let's take away maybe even their crypto and whatnot. Here is a person who has maybe this much savings, yeah? And here's a person who has this many liabilities. Hmm? Maybe let's add some money to his uh, TFSA. Let's make it, um, yeah, you know what, it's okay, the points, it's fine. 29,000, okay? And their liabilities are a lot, 40,000. Their net assets are negative. Hmm? There is no zakat, that's due. There is no zakat, that's due. If your net assets are below nisab, no zakat. Again, the calculation is your whole net assets from your gold, silver, cash, investments, your business invest income, if you were you adding it to your cash at bank, all of that together, removing from that your loans, if that is below the nisab, no zakat. All right? So that is that, alhamdulillah. Great question, brother Tayyib. Okay, Sister Hoda asks a question. Can you explain a little bit more about RESP? If, you, if I have four children at different ages, one went to university, now the child takes an amount of money equal to tuition, pays it. Do we pay zakat on that portion? Excellent question, Sister Hoda. So like I mentioned, there is uh, many, there's three opinions there that are shared, right? If you follow the Hanafi position there, no zakat. And, 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 and actually the topic itself that I'm, using as an analogy is talking about something that I think is similar to an RSP or a group RSP account, okay? So that's one caveat, but assume that they are analogous enough to be close enough to be same, okay? You have Hanafi position, they say no zakat at all. You can follow that position, no problem at all. The one that I recommend is the Maliki position, which is you, the day you get that money, you pay zakat on it once, and that's it, okay? So in the case of your children, the day they get their RESP, the first one, for example, gets his RESP or gets her RESP, before they pay the tuition, they pay 2.5% of that as zakat, alhamdulillah, and they pay the rest in tuition and they move on. I hope that makes it clear, but you can follow the Hanafi position there as well and not pay any zakat on it, and that is fine as well, wallahu uh, But you have the option of choosing, and this is from the, uh, the uh, the vastness of Islam if one if you follow one madhab for how to give zakat on jewelry you need to follow the same madhab on how to deal with investments uh, great question um, no because the, you would consider them to be different uh, asset classes right you can follow a different position on investments like maybe for RESPs you want to follow the Hanafi position that is fine because it's a completely different type of investment account but for the zakat on jewelry you want to follow the Maliki position or the Hanbali or the Shafi position, that is also fine. But the Umar, no problem with that. Great question. Jazakallah khairan. Now, when you're paying zakat on your cash savings, do you pay on the current balance on the lower of last year's and this year's balance? No, you pay on the current balance. The balance on the day first of Ramadan, if that's your date, first of Ramadan, the balance on that date is what you pay on zakat on. Wallahu uh, When you add liabilities, is the monthly payment or the amount paid for the year. So we answered that. You take for a long-term loan, mortgage, car loan, student loan, take the principal and multiply by 12. And that amount is considered to be your yearly loan. That is what's taken away from your net assets. Wallahu alam. Do I need to inform a person if I'm paying zakat to him? Great question. Great question, Brother Ibrahim. Okay. If you are paying zakat to somebody who is used to receiving charity, hmm? they are used to receiving charity. It's normal for them. You don't have to tell them it's zakat. In fact, it's disliked because that's like a type of a humiliation, okay? But if it's a person who isn't receiving you know, any sadaqah or isn't used to getting sadaqah, right? They don't, they don't usually take this. And you know that if you told them, they would say, I'm not going to take zakat, right? Then that is a person you have to get their permission to give them zakat. I hope that point is clear. The differentiation is the one who's used to getting help, sadaqah or zakat or otherwise, you don't have to tell them anything, whether you're giving them zakat or you're giving them sadaqah. 
okay? But someone who isn't in the habit of receiving um, financial or monetary help, you have to disclose to them that this is zakat. If you know or you're quite sure that they will reject it if they knew it was zakat. You have to tell them and you have to get their permission. Wallahu okay? And this is the position of Sheikh Ibn al Thaymin and others on the matter. Should I pay, should the person, I pay zakat for, no, is this zakat? Same question there, alhamdulillah. I don't think we answered that one, alhamdulillah. And lastly, Brother Omar's question, which is when you subtract off liabilities like loans, does that include car loans and mortgages, even though they are for fixed assets? So a great question. So fixed assets, we're thinking of that, that differentiation was for businesses, business commodities, right? Your personal items that you own, your car, your home, okay? Uh, the way we own things now is we have to go into debt to own things. This is a musibah by itself, but this is our reality, okay? So how much of that debt is to be subtracted from your net, to, from your total assets? Hmm? How much of that? If you were to subtract your mortgage amount, bismillah, you're not paying any zakat for the next 20 years, <laughs> right? Uh, so that's the, therein lies the problem, Right? That's why you take the yearly principle of your loan as your short-term loan. The yearly principle of your long-term loan, you take that as your short-term loan, and that's the amount you take away from your savings, and the rest of it you pay zakat on. I hope that makes sense, Brother Omar, inshallah. And if you, if, if you want to like maybe speak about it, you can raise your hand, and you can speak about it if you like to, or if you're good, very good, inshallah. All right, barakallahu feekum. Jazakumullah khair, everybody. It's really nice to uh, be here with you all to, to do this uh, webinar. I was looking forward to it and very happy that you all stayed till the end. Uh, again, tomorrow we are starting, uh, inshallah, our taraweeh. We're also starting a juz a day, starting at 6.30 p.m. So please tune into that. You will really, inshallah, enjoy it. I hope you will uh, come out to that and I'll hope to see you all for other webinars. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu la ilaha illa anta. نستغفرك ونتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته